Welcome. Welcome to reInvent. Welcome to our session. My name is Eugene Stepanov. I'm senior manager with AWS, and I manage team of solution architects. Uh, we are database specialist solution architects, and my team focuses on SQL Server, obviously. And today, I'm joined by Al Smith. Al, um, Al is CTO with iSIMS, and his organization just went through a massive migration. They migrated a large footprint from EC2 over to RDS. And towards the end of the session, he will join me here on stage, and he will share his experience. Um, so that's probably the most interesting part of this presentation. I don't know. Eugene, I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation <laughs> as well. So I, right. uh, I'll follow up in a little bit. Thanks all so right. much. All right. Um, all right. We have jam-packed agenda for today. So let's go over it. First, for those of you who are new to RDS, we will take a look at what RDS is. Then we'll take a look at our hosting options. So if the question is, OK, how do I run my SQL Server workload on AWS, we will try to answer here exactly that question. Then we will take a look at our performance and scalability uh, area and see what type of innovations we've, we've, recently, we've recently added to the platform. Then we will move on to high availability and disaster recovery space and see what's new in that area, right? And there are a couple of interesting, couple of interesting features here, such as job replication, um, uh, SQL agent job replication, that is, and um, cross-region read replicas. Then we will move on to backups and migration and check out a couple of new features, such as um, TD encrypted backups. Now you can bring your TD encrypted backups to RDS, right? This is a brand new feature. And then we just added um, access to the transaction logs. And that was not available before. And um, as I mentioned before, towards the end, I'll invite Al and he will share the ISIMS journey. Uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be very, very interesting. All right, with that, Let's jump straight to it. For those of you who are new to RDS, or relational database service, that is, RDS has been designed with a single mission in mind, and that is to free you up, you, our customers, from the tasks and responsibilities that our system administrators and, and database administrators spend countless hours on a daily basis. Uh, maintenance and monitoring, backups and point-in-time restore, high availability, disaster recovery, that list goes on and on and on, right? Well, you might say, uh, so what's the problem? We've been doing it for a while, and we got pretty good at it, and that's true. Uh, but the problem is, as these, all these tasks are very, very important to keep the lights on, but the problem is none of these tasks add actual value to your customers. None of these tasks differentiate you, your business, from that of your competition unless you're in the business of managing infrastructure for your customers. And now we come to a, and now this is a perfect opportunity for you to outsource all of those, all of those tasks to RDS and redeploy those very valuable resources, those precious resources, to projects and efforts that differentiate your business from that of your competition. So why RDS? Well, RDS because now we are responsible for hardware monitoring and maintenance. We, RDS, now responsible for both OS level as well as SQL level monitoring and maintenance. Um, minor version upgrades now on us. We automated backups endpoint in time restore to a point where it becomes a checkbox experience. All you gotta do is click a checkbox and select any number of days anywhere from zero to 35, and we will maintain the unbroken chain of backups for that many days to give you that point in time restore capabilities. 
Same for high availability. Those of you who deployed something like high uh, failover cluster instances or possibly always on availability group, you know how involved that process is, how many moving parts to it. Here, again, it's a checkbox experience. You click multi-AZ and under the hood, we will deploy a second um, synchronous hot standby in the second availability zone so we can fail over, God forbid, something happens with your primary, right? Um, same with the both in-region and cross-region disaster recovery and scale-out. Maybe your workload could benefit from having a read replica in either in-region or possibly even in other region um, where you could direct your read-only traffic um, so all that reporting stuff, all those reporting workloads don't hit the, don't hit the master, don't hit the primary node, right? Or maybe you want to do it for the disaster recovery purposes. That's all automated now. Again, few clicks on the console and you can have up to five asynchronous read replicas deployed in either uh, same region or a different region. And last but not least, Monitoring tools, and we have great variety here. Uh, th that list goes on and on and on. CloudWatch, Enhanced Monitoring, OS Process List, Performance Insights, um, and the, the best part, it, it comes out of the box, right? There is nothing for you to monitor. There is nothing for you to install and maintain. It's all part of the platform. All right. Let's take a look at our hosting options. Now, those of you who are not new to RDS, or AWS, I should say, you're already familiar with our two options that existed for a long time, right? On the very left, you've got SQL Server on EC2, and on the very right, there is RDS for SQL Server. Again, these options existed for a long time. So SQL on EC2, what that involves, it involves launching a virtual machine on AWS, installing your SQL server on that virtual machine, and really from that point on, running your SQL workload on AWS is not too different from the way you would run it in your own private virtualized environment. Uh, of course, we'd still be responsible for the hardware and for initial OS installation, but, but, but the rest of it is really your responsibility. There is no managed experience here, right? But with that option, you get great, greatest flexibility, right? You have access to the operating system and file system and SA, SA access to the SQL instance and it's all yours, right? Um, on the very right, on the RDS, on the other hand, a lot of these things that we mentioned in the previous slide come to you as a managed experience where we, RDS, responsible for all those things. But of course, because now we on the hook to deliver them to you as a managed experience, we're gonna have to put some guardrails around what you can and cannot do on RDS. So for example, OS level access, no longer support it. You cannot, cannot uh, RDP into the box and take full control over the host. On RDS, that is not supported. Um, file system, you no longer have access to the file system. So imagine the case where maybe you need to install some third-party component on that host, right? So on RDS, it's not supported. Now, we take customer feedback very, very seriously at AWS. In fact, 90% of our roadmap is, is driven by feedback from our customers. And the feedback was, well, we still want to maintain the flexibility that EC2 gives us, but we want that managed experience that RDS provides. And we put our heads together, and out of that effort, RDS Custom was born. 
So that's the, that's the option in the middle. We launched RDS Custom in December, December 1st of last year. And um, essentially, it, it's, a, it's a hybrid option. As I said, you maintain full control, yet we deliver managed experience to you. So now you can do stuff like logging into the box and installing uh, third-party components and possibly running CLR, which is not available on RDS, and possibly opening up uh, XPCMD shell and executing the OS commands, right? Again, that's not available on RDS. But now, because you have full control, but we are responsible for the managed experience, it now makes it shared management responsibility, and I, I hope it, it makes sense, at least conceptually, right? And what it means is that we're gonna do our best effort to deliver that managed experience to you as long as you stay within the support perimeter, right? Because now um, using that SA access, using the OS level access, you can modify, um, you, you can configure the instance so it becomes suboptimal from the point of view of our automation, and automation cannot proceed. So very, very important, you gotta stay within the support perimeter. Now, RDS custom is a huge topic. One hour wouldn't be enough if we were talking about RDS custom only. So for the rest of the session, I will not focus on RDS custom. So if that's what you're interested about, if you think you might have a workload that would be a good fit for RDS Custom, please come see me after this, after this session, or please stop by at our booth uh, at the Expo Hall. We would love to talk to you, but again, for the rest of this presentation, I'll leave the RDS Custom alone, and I'll focus on, on RDS for SQL Server. All right? All right. So let's take a look what's new in the performance and scalability space. Now, any database deployment or SQL deployment or, or any database deployment for that matter starts with a good, powerful compute node, right? That's where you start. And now we, we, have, we on RDS have a great variety. I don't have time right now to go over all the available options we have available in RDS. I mean, just simply don't have time. But I will say that whatever your workload might be, the chances are we will have a good fit for you. Now, most of the time we see our database workloads, our SQL workloads be uh, storage subsystem bound and we have a good answer to that. And once in a while, we come across a case where it's a CPU bound, and we have a, have a good answer to that in the form of Z1D instances also. Here, there is a new addition to our general purpose and our memory optimized family. So for those of you who are not familiar with our naming convention, M is our general purpose instances, and R is our uh, memory optimized instances. So this is brand new generation, latest and greatest. We added support, RDS uh, added support for these two new instance types in March of this year. And these instance types are built using the latest third generation Xeon uh, scalable processor. Uh, and the code name for the microarchitecture is the, is the Ice Lake. So that, that this is the latest one. So there are some stats here. Please take a look at them. Uh, I will just add that the hammer DB tests that we've done, that I've seen, that our folks have, have, have done just recently, support all these numbers. And I would even say th these numbers look on the, on the conservative side. I think, I think if, if you currently using something like R5 or M5, um, please take a look at these instances. I think you will be very pleasantly surprised. Um, all right. 
Oh, and one more thing, almost forgot. The last bullet right there. And with these instances, we also added the next t-shirt size, the, X, the, the 32X large. So if 24X large wasn't powerful enough, was, wasn't big enough, now you have 32X large with 128 vCPUs and, and terabyte of RAM. Good stuff. All right. Powerful compute node is just a part of the equation, right? Storage subsystem is another part of the same equation, right? And you, again, if you worked with RDS before, uh, GP2 and IO1 have been available for a long time. And we just, just a couple of weeks ago, we added support for GP3. Again, our next generation general purpose um, elastic block uh, service. Now, take a look at some of these stats. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just mention the, the, the difference, right? Well, first and foremost, GP3 now allows you to scale your IOPS and throughput independently of the size. If you remember GP2, uh, essentially the performance of your storage volume, of your volume, was tied to the size. So if you need more IOPS, the only, the only um, option you had is to increase the volume, and of course you would pay for it. Here on GP3, you, you can essentially, well, you have 3,000 IOPS as a baseline, and then on top of that, you can purchase additional IOPS or, uh, or megabytes per second. So it gives you great, great flexibility comparing to GP2. And, um, and another, another good point is the max throughput volume, right? The throughput now you can scale it all the way to 1,000 megabytes per second. Good, good, very powerful stuff. And maybe one more different, uh, difference is that now the IOPS to, to, um, uh, to gigabyte ratio, you can scale it up to the 500 to 1 ratio. So 500 IOPS per every gig, right? So again, it is a whole lot more flexible now comparing to GP2. All right. New product. Well, RDS Proxy is not new. RDS Proxy has been around for some time, and we just added support for SQL Server in September of this year. Now, RDS Proxy delivers the improvement on these three different dimensions. Connection pooling, failover, seamless, seamless or faster failover, and improved security. Now, let's talk about them in, in exactly that order. Um, connection pooling. Well, you might say, look, uh, I have my .NET app. It's written on a recent .NET framework. I'm using ADO.NET. I already have a connection pooler. Why would I need a proxy uh, in the middle? And that might be true. If that's your use case, maybe, maybe RDS proxy is not something you want to introduce. But imagine another scenario. And imagine a scenario where you have containerized application or possibly even serverless application with, with thousands of containers being orchestrated by, by orchestration uh, uh, platform and all of them trying to connect to, to, trying to hit your SQL Server database. Well, to remind you, for SQL Server to support even idle connection, that's an overhead, right? So by, by introducing something like this in the middle that gives you a global connection pooler, right? So the, um, the, the, the dot .NET, ADO.NET, would give you the, the connection pooling locally, but there is no global connection pooler to speak of, right? But by introducing the RDS proxy, again, when you have thousands of these containers or Lambda functions making connections to SQL, you will greatly improve uh, and reduce the overhead on your, on your SQL server. Uh, seamless failovers. 
Well, you might say, uh, look, I'm, I'm using the latest SQL Server, or not necessarily latest, but, but, but some, some 2016, say, and above, and uh, I have a listener endpoint, right? And on the application side, I'm, I'm again, I'm using ADO.NET, and my driver supports um, um, multi-subnet failover equals true setting. My failovers already in a single digit second territory, right? How do you improve that? Well, it is true. But imagine the case where, in some cases, you don't have access to a listener endpoint. Maybe you connect into a DNS endpoint. Uh, if you connect into a DNS endpoint by introducing something like RDS proxy, which will be aware of both IPs, and as soon as, as, soon as primary goes down, it would immediately route the traffic to the secondary, essentially completely short-circuiting the DNS propagation. So whatever, whatever your setting is for the, for, the, for the TTL, essentially you completely short-circuiting and, 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 and throwing away those 20 seconds or, or how many seconds there, right? Making it whole, whole lot, whole lot faster. Um, another improvement uh, on this dimension. Uh, so imagine if you connect in directly, even if you have a listener endpoint, well, when our uh, client trying to connect to a SQL server, when you're in a process of failing over, then it's gonna return an exception. It's gonna return an error, right? In the case of the RDS proxy, because you're not connecting directly to SQL, you're connecting to the proxy, all those connections just be queued up. And as soon as new primary comes, comes online, um, those connections will be served. So you will have a whole, um, whole lot better failover experience, I should say. Well, and the last one, improved security. Um, uh, maybe, maybe, um, well, unless you're using something like Windows authentication, right, the chances are that you are storing your username and password somewhere in the code, somewhere in the web config, app config, you know, that kind of deal. And, you know, that, that, has, that has all kinds of vulnerabilities for all kinds of obvious reasons, right? So now you can enable uh, something like this, where you have your application using access identity management for authentication, and that authentication is done by the short-lived uh, security tokens, right? So you authenticate against IAM, but then you make connection to Amazon RDS proxy, and Amazon proxy retrieves the secret from the secrets manager, and that secret will be used to connect to your RDS SQL server. So by implementing something like this, you will greatly improve your security posture. All right. All right, uh, moving on. Let's take a look what's new in high availability and disaster recovery space. Uh, Multi-Z and SQL Server job replication. Now, multi-Z, and I mentioned about this already, uh, multi-Z has been around for a long time, and, um, uh, but the problem with the, with the multi-Z is that the instance level objects usually live in the system databases, and the system databases are not part of the availability group, right? So anything that sits in MSDB essentially not being replicated. So what would you have to do before if you, let's say, deploy a brand new SQL agent job to your primary, what you have to do before, you would have to fail over and deploy it again. Or you would have to deploy your SQL agent job, convert your multi-Z instance into single AZ, deploy your job, and then convert single AZ to multi-AZ again. If you, do, if you do it that way, 
because we rely on the full EBS snapshot when we initially seed the, the, the secondary. Uh, if you do it that way, then, then initially that new job will make it to, to the secondary. So, but now you don't have to do it. Now there is a special process that will uh, pick up any new jobs, any updated jobs on the primary and replicate them over to the, to the, pri uh, to the secondary. Now there is, a, uh, there is a soft limit of 100 jobs here, but, and if that's not enough, give us a call and we'll, we'll bump that up. Next one. Uh, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with uh, in-region uh, read replicas, we had in-region replicas for, for, for a while now, right? And now we're extending it to uh, cross-region. So essentially, essentially now you can go cross-country if you want to, right? Just, just be aware that speed of light is still a speed of light and there's no way for us to, you know, to, to work around that problem, right? But now you can have up to five asynchronous. They're all asynchronous. You cannot change that. It's not configurable. All these asynchronous replicas, again, up to five of them, you can do it either in region or cross region. All right, migrations. Now, um, native backups have been such an important part of the ecosystem uh, that our platform would be well received if we wouldn't support this, right? And we supported native backups for a long, long time. Now, what wasn't supported before is ability to bring uh, TDE encrypted backups because there was no place where we would you put the, the certificates, right? There was, originally there was no no capabilities of bringing the certificates. And now you can bring those certificates. So essentially, well, here's the, here's the, the, the key hierarchy, how you usually build it, right? It, sta it starts with the Windows Data Protection APIs, and it goes all the way down to the data encryption key. And now you can back up the, that X509 certificate. You can bring it over to RDS, put it in S3 bucket. Then you can... Um, Using our API, we give you the API, you can restore that certificate, and um, after you uh, upload your TD encrypted backup, uh, essentially you can now restore it, right? Great, great capability. People have been, people have been um, waiting for it. So please use it if, if, that's, if that's your case. If you use a TDE, now it's here. Now you can use it. And the... Next one is native backup and T-log access. As I said before, native backups have been, have been supported for a long time, but the asymmetry existed where you could have bring full differential and log backup to RDS, but you did not have access to the transaction log backups, right? You could only initiate uh, full and differential, and you could bring them down, download them, and, and do whatever whatever with them, right? Those are your backups. You can do whatever with them. And now we add in support for the logs. You can now also have access to those transaction logs. You can control them. The transaction logs still being controlled by us. We're going to take them every five minutes as a part of our managed experience promised to you. Right, but now you can have access to them. So great, great, powerful feature. Well, uh, that brings us to the end of this part of the presentation. Here are some other notable releases, right? IPv6 been launched, multidimensional models been launched for analysis services. If that's something you do, then, then it's now available. And um, uh, email support for the reporting services. So now you can actually uh, email those reports out of the RDS instance. And, um, and Oracle Driver for the linked server also just been added just a couple of weeks ago. All right? And uh, we have great content. As I said, welcome to reInvent. This is the third day. We still have lots of sessions, great speakers. So 
These are some of the SQL Server and, 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 and more generally database-related sessions, so, so please join us. And that brings us to else part. Else, come on up and tell us about Tell us about your experience and what you've learned. Thanks so much, Eugene. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, take you through a little bit of uh, who iSIMS is, just so you have a context of the kind of scale and, uh, and, uh, and maybe challenges that you run into in looking at a project like this. Um, real quick thing, this is always dangerous when you let the CTO use a marketing slide. But um, uh, just who iSIMS is, is we're a talent acquisition software vendor. Uh, our tagline is help you attract, engage, hire, and advance your winning workforce. So basically, how do you build you all into a company to build the great staff, right? Uh, our application is called the Talent Cloud, uh, and we really look at that full life cycle of hiring. The reason I bring up this complexity is we build experiences for many different personas. Uh, the people who are doing the work, the recruiters, sourcers, hiring managers, certainly the candidates and employees who are being hired, but also the executives that are looking at trends that are business and business outcomes. So all different layers of workload, all different layers of volume and activity. And across all of the applications, we heavily work with AI and talent intelligence to get to the business outcomes. Really important to put that together. And our products are organized in those different areas of attract, engage, hire, and advance. At, at our scale, uh, we have 4,000 plus customers on a global basis. Uh, supporting the application in 30 plus languages. Uh, we are hosting in seven different global data centers. I'll add that this is an area, and I was talking with the RDS team, this is an area that's getting more and more and more complex. We deal with people data and with data residency rules around the world, data privacy rules, uh, certainly compliance rules, and always thinking about security. This is harder and harder, and there actually are some enhancements I, I want to see. Um, we handle incredible volumes, 150 plus million applicants a year. Uh, about 5.7, 5.8 million people hired through our software every year uh, over looking at the last year. And any given day, more than a million, two million people logged into our applications around the world. Uh, another big part of our application, which adds to the complexity of the data load, is that we have 700 different applications, partner applications, that integrate to our platform and are often either enriching that data or reading from that data. So a lot of complexity of what we do. These companies that you look at the bottom here are often deploying our application in you know, hundreds of countries on a global basis. Uh, I mentioned all the partnerships. This is everything from the front end experience of the different job boards and background check and assessment vendors, all the vendors that you need to use to figure out um, is this the right person and are they qualified for what you're looking for. And then once you've hired them, the payroll and HCM systems and you know, talent development systems that uh, all this works on. So you're looking at an end to end flow of data going across here. I mentioned the global hosting. We're hosting in the US, Canada, EU primarily. Uh, we have tentative plans looking at Asia PAC. We've put footprints down. Don't currently have any customers hosted there, just to give you a sense of our footprint. Talk a little bit about the kind of case that we wanted to solve for. So, you know, this is kind of, I'm going to tell you the end story here. We migrated about 3,500 customer databases, 270 terabytes of data. We went from the slide that Eugene showed you of self-hosting on EC2 to go into RDS. Not RDS custom, just RDS for SQL Server. Uh, I think this is really one of the big points of what appealed to me. Uh, we're a fast-growing company, always asked to do more with less. Having our team be able to not spend cycles on undifferentiated work was really important for us to scale our business. This checked that box for us. The other thing is, Fundamentally, and I think you'll see this as I go through our slides, I think it improved many of the things we were managing ourselves, everything from patch management to maintenance times, other areas, our audit and compliance requirements. A lot of things I think got a lot easier. Didn't hurt that we also were able to reduce cost. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We were using SQL Server Enterprise Edition. As it turned out, our application didn't have any dependencies needing Enterprise Edition. We were using it for the availability zones and disaster recovery, and this replaced that. Now, that's something you need to look at and see if that would work for you. But for us, 
that was really valuable to be able to save a million dollars on an annual basis in those fees. Um, I do think by eliminating access to the operating system and removing database system access, our overall security footprint has improved. Uh, and that's tough because, you know, our database administrators, our cloud hosting team, uh, who do an amazing job, are used to doing those kinds of optimizations. But increasingly, uh, as a, it's SOC 2 rules and ISO rules and data privacy rules, particularly on, on uh, ISO 27018, uh, having that access is a liability that the audit requirements are getting bigger and bigger. So how did this all work and what is our journey? Uh, seven years ago, we were hosted in a physical data center um, and you know, managing the complete life cycle that Eugene took you through completely ourselves. We started going into AWS in a hybrid way. I'm not sure I would repeat this today, but at the time it made sense. We moved the application workload into AWS and we kept the databases in a co-located physical data center at first. That was a very short window. We then went to full cloud deployment where we were managing everything on EC2. And now we've really started to take advantage of the managed services and has given us an amazing lift. Now there's other modernization we continue to do like considering moving off of SQL Server. However, this lift has been really substantial and value, valuable to us as a major step. <clears throat> uh, this is a slide that talks about the benefits. Eugene kind of gave you a different one of, you know, what's the work you're responsible for when you go on on RDS? You know, that left-hand side, the schema design, query construction, query optimization. Think about areas where your team is doing the differentiated value-add work to give better experience to your customers. That's your focus. For all the things on the right that your team used to be tied up doing, you're no longer doing that. That is powerful. That is really powerful and has an amazing ROI. So let's take you through the journey a little bit more detail. Um, I think a couple things here, I'm gonna build this out just to keep us moving along. Uh, when we first looked at this, we couldn't make the move to RDS. Our application, everybody runs the same source code, we're a SaaS vendor, but each database container on RDS, on an RDS cluster is a separate customer. So we're single tenant at the container level to our customer. And at the time that we first looked at RDS, the number of containers you could have on a cluster was just too low. Our scale out would have added complexity, uh, even though there's some value in scale out. But working with the RDS team, by the way, an amazing partnership working together. Um, you know, getting to the point where we could have 100 databases on an instance, that read, led to the tipping point where this started to really look like a good solution for us. Cross-region snapshot, excited about the new enhancements for it, but being able to take advantage of cross-region region snapshot in part of our disaster recovery was really a critical capability. Uh, we make use of linked servers extensively, and so that ability and enhancement was really important for our application without having to write our application changes in any material way. And then taking advantage of scaled storage. This is both a cost as well as a performance benefit of being able to use it when you need it. Um, and we do have a high thread memory really driven by all those integrated products. And so the ability to max that memory settings in SQL to handle all the threads and ports is really important for us. Actually interested in exploring the RDS proxy uh, to see if there's even, even better optimizations I can get. Um, and it, once we had that, um, it really helped with basic latency working through. So these were important innovations that came about in RDS that said, okay, we can move ahead. This is now a configuration that will support our application. So the so what all the time is, well, how long did it take? And I want to break this up into the really important chunks. So 100 days, once we said, okay, we could go. The important part is 50% of that time was planning, right? We spent 50% of the time figuring out what the plan was going to be. We spent four weeks of testing, 25% of the time doing the testing. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the test sets and how we approach that. Really important, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know, uh, workload shapes are very different across different applications. Even within the same quote unquote application, uh, my workloads are very, very different depending on the customer. You know, a customer that's hiring eight, 9,000 people a week uh, with a simple workflow of how they hire is very different shape of behavior from a customer who might be hiring a thousand people a year with a very complex workflow. So I have, even in the same application, different shapes and sizes. And it was important to pick kind of 
representative models of those shapes and sizes as part of our test bed to understand where we were gonna run into the problems. Really important. And as always, prove to ourselves, both through tabletop and actual test, disaster recovery, high availability failover, doing migration dry runs uh, over and over and over. One, know how long. Two, what problem? Smoke them out. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> Uh, support for LogShip would have been great if that was available, because we love using LogShip. Uh, now that it is, we certainly would have done it that way, so I'd highly advise looking at that. But those dry runs really made a difference. And then lastly, doing the actual migration. Now, we went to our install base in waves. We generally push code out in waves, so this was very consistent to how we understood. But I think the big win here is we had a four-hour downtime for any of our customers. That was the max. And by the way, it was within our service levels that we were allowed to have on a monthly basis. So that really fit no business disruption, no extraordinary behaviors. Customers didn't have to think about or worry about what was going on. That less than four hour downtime was the win. But that came about from the planning and the testing on what we were gonna do, right? So I can't emphasize that enough. I'll stop repeating it till you wanna smack me, but uh, it's something you need to keep in mind, right? Okay, so what did we look like before? We were SQL Server Enterprise Edition, 35 EC2 clusters, we were manually deployed, and we had a million dollars plus in licensing that we were paying to Microsoft for the Enterprise Edition. After 100 Amazon RDS instances, spread wider and optimized. We actually changed the way we balanced and loaded the RDS clusters versus what we were doing on EC2. There were a variety of reasons for that, the shape and size mix, uh, the bandwidth differences, understanding what we wanted around the notion of noisy neighbors, uh, thinking about workload. So we changed our models, and that was important and valuable as part of that planning. Uh, going to standard edition worked just fine. Automated deployment via Terraform. Everything we do in our shop is automated. Uh, I really, it really frowned upon the idea of somebody manually touching something. It just isn't the way we run our shop. And this was an investment to make sure that those test runs were all run deployed with the same run deploy we would use for normal provisioning and the same Terraform we would use for disaster recovery. All the same. So we're working it, exercising and testing the life cycle just by doing daily actions. Uh, certainly all the benefits that Eugene covered on RDS. It's real, it's material, it matters. Um, our team has been able to handle an ever larger number of customers of all scale and sizes without having to grow the team as aggressively. Uh, that level of simplicity has been really helpful. I mentioned earlier about the testing. Uh, there was something that came out about that was not an intended outcome, but a really nice benefit. Uh, one of the benefits is that we actually got better performance. We weren't expecting that. It wasn't a criteria. I certainly didn't want to slow down. But the fact that we did get better performance, especially at wide bandwidth, was really helpful uh, to, first of all, sell everybody to be on board. Everybody always wants a faster application, faster system. That was a big help and a big benefit. Um, I think these workloads that we did were big enough to kind of handle representing, and there were more tests than this, but these two, just kind of for reference, one is kind of a bulk load kind of experience, something that can really screw with a you know, OLTP application configuration. Having that as something that was going on while we were driving load was really important for us. And then of course, you know, those different complex fields that were out there. So these were good representative, I'll say the well-worn path of behaviors we expected to see, and those were part of the test spaces that we worked in with. So what did we learn out of all this? You know, uh, Let's start with one thing. It is more expensive than EC2. And you know, I would say there's a lot of people who get sticker shock when they go, oh, we could do this ourselves. And the answer is, well, sure, you could. But at what real cost? Look at the full ROI, not just the base cost, right? If you're directly comparing it, you know, keep in mind the pricing includes Microsoft licensing. So that's something you have to take into account in your ROI so you no longer have to use your own licenses. For us, that was really helpful. Uh, simplification for high availability. For me, it's all about the simplification. Uh, as you get bigger, as you scale, there's two kinds of scalability that come back. And 
I try to get my team, and, and I'll say one of the learnings when you go from managing everything yourself to a managed service, radical simplicity has bigger and higher value than radical optimization. I'm going to tell you that I have a team of brilliant people who love to radically optimize to that nth degree. And by our history, we needed to do that, right? To get the performance and the cost in a constrained environment where we couldn't dynamically change those constraints. But now you're moving into a place where those are no longer your constraints. And for us, not just the scalability of applications, but the scalability of the people to scale the growth of our business, radical simplicity has way more value than radical optimization. And that's just a change in mindset from what most of our team looked at things. Uh, that impact on our staff around patching and updates and maintaining and audit and logging and everything else, what a, what a relief. And no impact on maintenance time. These are things that we had to do in maintenance windows and it was always impactful to our customers. Uh, we took advantage of ephemeral storage you know, for our TempDB. That was really valuable. Um, again, your application may have a different shape that may be a non-factor for you or a low factor. But if you have an intensive TempDB workload, uh, use an instant class that really lets you expand that and really take advantage of it. And in our case, it gave us a 20% performance lift. So nice options depending on the shape of your application. Uh, use the hardware metrics when planning your destination. And I think by that, uh, we looked at uh, how are we configured on EC2? How comparable is to those hardware metrics to RDS? And I would say we were pleasantly surprised that they were close enough and alike enough we could figure out apples to apples kind of sizing and capacity. Now, it was verified by the testing, but I, I would say we were really pleasantly surprised. It was close enough that we really didn't have to get into all the details, so. And then, you know, Validate if you still need SQL Server Enterprise Edition. Just be aware, <laughs> Standard Edition has limitations, so just be aware, does your application have dependencies other than high availability or disaster recovery use? Um, you might have dependencies. We did not, and that was an advantage that gave us some capabilities. So, With that, I thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the time.